what exists in every corner of the world. Embraced and celebrated in some countries. But it's illegal in 76. What is hidden for fear of public shame, imprisonment, torture, or in seven countries even? Even the death penalty. What tears families apart? What makes people confront brutal violence on a daily basis? What simple trait gets people treated as second-class citizens everywhere they go? What gets children kicked out of homes, students bullied and expelled from schools, and workers fired from jobs without warning? What has existed in every country throughout history that some people still consider abnormal? Being gay. Being lesbian. Bisexual. Or transgender. All over the world, millions of people face violence and discrimination just for being who they are. Every nation is obligated by international human rights law to protect all lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people from torture, discrimination and violence. The United Nations has one simple message to the millions of LGBT people around the world. You are not alone. You are not alone. LGBT rights are human rights. LGBT rights are human rights. Together, we will build a world. We will build a world that is free and equal. Good day everyone and welcome to this special program on lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender youth in focus for International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. Today I have with me a very, very diverse and interesting group of panelists um, who will be talking with us about LGBT youth issues. Please allow me to introduce them to you. First, we have Alexandra Herriman who is a peer educator and social justice activist at United Bricklayers, which is a non-governmental organization based in New Amsterdam, Burbies. And she's also a board member of the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination, SASOD. Also joining us is Audrey Michelle Rodriguez, Hello. education program officer at UNICEF. Yeah. Better known to me as Teacher Michelle, she was headmistress <laughs> when I went to Starters <laughs> Nursery School. Don't try to guess her age because I said that. <laughs> And Dan Bakker, who is the Guidance and Counseling Officer at the University of Guyana and also a practitioner in the field of clinical psychology. And also joining us is Runuka Nanjid. She's the Program Director at the Guyana Responsible Parenthood Association. Runuka is also the former Program Coordinator of the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination, SASOD. So she's very familiar with these issues from both vantage points. Before we start our panel discussion, we're going to have a look at a short video with perspectives from lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Guyanese youth who share different experiences around issues affecting them. My name is Scully King. I'm 31 years old. I'm a lesbian. My name is Roland Anthony Bagos Lamazon. I am 30 years old and I identify as gay male. Um, my name is Tony. I am 28 and I identify as a lesbian. At the age of 24, I realized that I'm a lesbian and from then to now it's been kind of difficult dealing with families and friends. When I decided to come out officially, I was 18. Uh, growing up in my household, um, we weren't taught uh, about uh, men being with men, women being with women, women and men needed to be together. Those were some of the things that was talked about in my home. And one of the experiences that I remember was, you know, uh, being in high school, um, I was in first form, and we had a concert, and 
This girl was modeling on stage in a swimsuit and I thought that she looked so beautiful and I couldn't help myself. I was like, yes, yeah, woo woo. I'm like, I'm going for it. And my friend hits me and she's like, are you a lesbian? And at that time I did not know what that word meant, but I knew it had to do with my reaction to the girl on the stage. So as an adult, um, what I find out is that to get a job, um, or to get anything done, you kind of have to do that extra little work. You kind of have to like force your way. Um, I remember applying at a certain um, company and um, in with, I mean, doing the interview and they were asking a whole bunch of questions and they were, I knew they were trying to get around to how I, um, how I identify. Um, and they were kind of saying that I may not be the best person for the job because of what happens, you know, around. Um, person who gave people how they behave, you don't want that in the workplace. So I had to like prove that I'm more professional. The time that it was good, you know, like like guys would see you and they respect you, even though you dress like a boy, they would say, wow, you got a lot of girls, and they would say, keep it up. And the times when people just see you and say, you want a real man, you can't do nothing for a girl, you can't breed a girl. No, they won't know the word breed. <laughs> or you can't breed a girl, and you know they get very aggressive. One of the worst experiences that I would have had um, I remember an ex-girlfriend of mine, um, we were, were out on the walls with, um, with her cousin and you know, we were in the back, the back of the street where we you know, her and I were kissing, we were looking at the stars and um, he was on the phone, I think he was he was arguing with his girlfriend. I, I, and um, normally the the police would, you know, make rounds. You know, when you're at that part of the seawall, and they saw us, and they saw us kissing. They would have seen her and I kissing, and they pulled up and they. They told us that we needed to get into their car and they refused to let him sit in the car with us and I was so scared and I started to cry when one of the officers said to me, two, two good women going to waste, what I want is for him to give me some good hit. And that was, that was really hard for me because you would think that A police officer, you know, who's who's there to enforce the law and protect the citizens. They were saying those things to me, and that was really tough. And I remember her saying, "Don't cry; it's going to be okay." But it was so hard, and I was just thinking, you know, do they have the right to keep me in this car? Do they have the right to lock me up? What are the laws regarding, you know, this situation? How can the law help? people like myself, people in my community. That was the longest night I ever endured because they took us down to the station and they didn't want us to go up in this, into the station and they, you know, they, inter they had her cousin there for a while and at the end he ended up paying them and they dropped us home. They refused to, to let us out of the car and, you know, during the entire ride home, they kept saying some really, some really nasty things. You know, that was one of the most horrific experiences I've ever had. Um, I, that's something I, I never ever want to experience again because I was just thinking that they could rape us, they could beat us. There were so many things that they could do, and they could do it because they're the law.
some, sometimes I feel like I want to run away because you can't live that sort of life in Guyana. People tell you abusive stuff. I want to run away. I cry. I say, I just want to leave Guyana. I just want to be happy. I want to start a family. I want to get married. So it just made me want to run away. That time it lead me into a little depression because I think everybody has the right to live the life they choose to live without no discrimination. I never felt like committing suicide, it never get to that point because I said to myself, I'm not living to please anyone, I'm living to please myself. The, the amount of discrimination and stigma that, I, um, that were uh, directed towards me, I have considered suicide once in my life. Um, because what happened is it becomes so overwhelming, overwhelming that like you do have nobody to talk to. My family didn't know anything. I never told them at that time, and so um, I told them actually uh, my mom that I was gay when I was 22, and I made sure I was out of the country before I told her, right? Because I fear her. One of the things that I'm actually um, a little passionate about is when it comes to what I want to see. Um, especially in our school system, is that we have a little bit more proactive um, policies in terms of um, stigma and discrimination um, on the basis of um, or sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, I think things are a little bit too loose. Uh, we need a little bit more protection for, you know, for the marginalized population um, in the education system. Um, I deny it because I fear neglect, neglect from my family because I grew up in a very Christian background. So I just fear that my family would neglect me. And you know, that would be my advice. My advice would be to love who you are, accept yourself, and also realize that no matter what you do, you know, people are going to love you or hate you. Either way, you could be the best person that you could possibly be and people will still hate you. My advice towards people that are lesbian, transgender, homosexual are living in Guyana, it's, it's kind of hard being gay, living in Guyana, but just respect yourself and sometimes ignore the things that people throw in our face and we'll get you someday. Persons who are experiencing stigma and discrimination because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, um, what I would want to tell them is that it's not the end of the world. Um, you're not cursed or anything like that. It's just natural, it's just you. And now there is a lot more help, there's a lot more support, there's a lot more uh, people out there who are willing to you know, talk with you and to make you feel you know, a little bit more comfortable um, with yourself. I didn't have that back then. But now there's, uh, you know, like a lot more help, and there are places that you can, you know, you can go and, you know, just to uh, talk with someone. I see you in a lonely place How can you be so blind? You're still regretting the love you left Left behind Oh darling, I've seen you go through the changes Those were very interesting perspectives from lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender youth here in Guyana and I think they'll provide a very rich backdrop for the conversations we're gonna to have today in studio. First, let me start with Alessandra. Tell us about yourself, your school life, growing up here in Guyana. What's life been like for you? Okay. First of all, I'm an androgynous male to female transgender. I've identified as a transgender. And a transgender is someone whose gender identity is different from their biological sex or the sex they were assigned at birth. So in my case, I was born biologically male, but growing up, my gender identity didn't fit into that category of um, male or masculine. So my gender identity is female, but my biological sex is male. So I'm a male to female transgender. Um, there is a difference between transgender and cisgender. 
transgender are the persons whose gender identity doesn't match the biological sex, it's not in line. But the cisgender person is someone who is born biologically male, but their gender identity is male, or they may be born biologically female and their gender identity is female. So that's in line. Right. So most people are actually cisgender, cisgender and majority, transgender yes. people are a group of gender minorities. Minor yes. Okay. How do you identify, given that, just for the benefit of our viewers and even our panelists here today, how do you identify which pronoun do you prefer to be addressed I as? Do you see yourself as female, as woman, that sort of thing? Because my gender identity is female, I prefer a female pronoun mm -hmm. to be used. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I want to make clear is that not all transgender people are homosexual because transgender is an identity and homosexual is an orientation. So there are some transgender people who are heterosexuals. Right. Help us to, exp to understand those distinctions better because I think there's a great deal of confusion in Guyana around what is sexual orientation as opposed to what is gender identity. Yeah. So maybe st let's start with sexual orientation. Well, gender identity is a person's deeply felt um, internal um, self-awareness of themselves, how they see themselves as either male, female, or gender queer. That's in between of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And no one cannot um, decide your identity. You have to decide your own identity. With sexual orientation, that's the degree of attractiveness towards someone of the same sex, opposite sex, both sexes or all sexes. So it ranges from heterosexual, homosexual, bisexuality, somewhere in between, asexuality off of the um, spectrum, and pansexuality spanning the entire spectrum. Right. So in effect, on the spectrum of gender identity, a person could be anywhere, anywhere and be anywhere as well on the spectrum of yes. sexual orientation. Yes. So a transgender person could be heterosexual or homosexual. Both. Or bisexual yes. even. Okay. A cisgender person could be obviously um, anywhere on the sexual orientation spectrum, being heterosexual, sexual. bisexual, or homosexual. Yes. Fantastic. All right. Tell me about your experiences, particularly growing up and going to school in Guyana, particularly as you discovered your, your gender identity, discovered that you were transgender. What was that like for you? Did you go to school and grow up here in Barbies? Yes, I was born in Guyana. I went to school in Guyana. Um, being a transgender person, it's not easy because our gender identity doesn't match our biological sex. So our gender expression is contradictory to culturally expected norms and behavior surrounding masculinity and femininity. We grew up in a society where boys should act like boys, girls should act like girls, and there are certain roles and certain behavior associated with the particular gender. And when you're different, you don't really fit into that category. So people would always, always talk something or have something to say about you because you just don't fit into that category of the norm. I went to high school in New Amsterdam. After high school, I went on to sixth form. That's when I started hormone replacement therapy. Um, you start using hormones, there were side effects and there were changes people started to notice. And I think one of the hardest things for me when I was attending sixth form is when the smaller children would come up to me and ask me if I'm a boy or a girl. And I mean, I could deal with adults explaining um, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and that whole um, concept of sexuality. But when it comes to children, that was um, really hard for me to break it down at that level. It was a bit challenging in school because um, I've experienced um, transphobic violence, discrimination. Um, so it wasn't easy. And I guess I could speak on behalf of all LGBT in Guyana, just because you're different and you don't fit into um, the norm. There's always stigma discrimination there. Right. And I know the period where young people are in school, where children are grappling with these issues in school, is one of the most challenging periods. Yes. Um, for us at Sassad, um, we think LGBT children are probably the most vulnerable um, section of the community because they have, you, you know, you have, you're already dealing with the challenges of childhood and growing up, puberty, adolescence, and so on. And then it's compounded by homophobia and transphobia. And then seemingly very little structurally in place um, to address that. Michelle, from your perspective at UNICEF, 
what are some of the challenges that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender children are facing in our schools? And what do you think are some of the responses, some of the programs that we as a country need to implement to address those challenges? Okay, um, thank you. And from the UNICEF perspective, um, I'm sure you know, and for those who don't know, our mandate is based on the principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so the promotion and protection of children's rights is, is our business. And um, our programs that we are supporting with governments, and particularly the government of the Guyana, through various um, channels. There's the Child Friendly School Program, the Health and Family Life Education Program, and a few others, and of course the Child Protection Program. Well, we, our, our program deals in the big, at first with advocacy. Mm -hmm. And in terms of asking, uh, responding to your question about what are some of the areas that children would have encountered, um, while sometimes there isn't a clear-cut reason, but we know that there is the tendency of those children to suffer more. It's about the taunting, and um, which can be can be observed th throughout all levels of the school system. Um, but depending on the level of the school system, will the determine the kinds of experiences that child would have. Um, maybe at the nursery school level, uh, while other children may not recognize it, because of our attitudes and some of the stereotypes that adults would have had, they, an adult who might be a teacher or a parent observing certain tendencies might be one, overly protective, or just blatant and be harsh with that child, and probably saying to a child that, you know, you shouldn't do this. Maybe, for example, at nursery school level. When we talk about, let's say, something like free play, you know, where children are free to choose whatever they want, and the teacher might say, this child is always going to the dress-up corner or this child is always wanting to, to be um, pretending that um, he's in the kitchen and he's cooking, and, you know, and they might want to steer that child away from that activity and unconsciously making that child feel a, a sense of emptiness. So at the nursery school level, I think that would have been the child is not fulfilled, you're not allowing them to explore and probably reach their potential. Right. It could get um, a little more intense at the primary school in where you would begin to see the evidence of bullying. And bullying there, and while some, at some stage, persons might not think it's bullying, they might say, oh, this child is just being aggressive to others or didn't know how to behave in company of others and so on. And there would be, uh, probably teachers might be a little harsher because you're not doing what you're told or why are you so different, you know? So that begins in, and this is all unconscious. This is pretty new in our society and so on. So it's about what the child would have experienced, sometimes consciously or unconsciously in the school system. It gets worse in the secondary school as children get older and are, are more open to all kinds of experiences where it could be denial of their rights to be involved in certain activities, ostracism. Um, maybe the, the bullying gets worse, the violence and, and, and the beatings might, would begin. And all those things do is that they threaten your on-time schooling, it will threaten your attendance in some part places, it might threaten your participation in school, and um, you're transitioning from one level 
to the other level, and I'm, when I say levels, I'm talking nursery, primary, secondary, and then post-secondary. And then when that happens, there is likely to be unsuccessful completion. Children might drop out or they're, they're, they're going through the motions and um, falling and uh, becoming deviants because people don't understand them. And um, those are some of the, the, the things that could happen to a child. I've tried to give you from nursery, primary, and yeah. secondary. In terms of what UNICEF is doing, like I said, we work on the basis of the principles of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. And one of the things that we make certain is that no child, whether um, whatever their sexual orientation or gender identity um, perceived or otherwise, no child should be denied the right to that kind of orientation and, and that identity. And this is one of our programs. While maybe we in our child-friendly schools programming and rights education, this is what we this is going to be our mantra. This is our mantra and it is beginning to help us in how we begin to influence policies and so on. Great. Let me ask them to jump in here because I think you touched on some important consequences of how the homophobic violence and so on impacts children's education. I think there's an important link there to mental health and well-being and psychosocial outcomes for children experiencing uh, discrimination. Dam, I know you work a lot with students. Um, so just from your clinical experience, your counseling experience and so on, what are some of the psychosocial issues that children who might be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or questioning um, face when they're going through these kind of turbulent periods, and how does it affect their education? I appreciate the opportunity to be able to contribute here today, because I think that this, is, um, this is a subject that is overlooked, unfortunately, far too much. Um, in Guyanese society. And I pick up sort of where Michelle leaves off because I, I work at the tertiary level primarily. Um, but to underscore the importance and the, the drastic nature of the experience that um, questioning and, and all range of sexual orient oriented people experience, I would say this. My very first client was killed because he was differently sexually oriented. My very first client, that was my introduction to Guyana. And since then, I've been able to understand how gender roles pervade this society, unfortunately, uh, to the detriment of many people, um, not just people who are questioning or identify differently, but all of us, because it skews our perspective of what is, what is normal, what is right, because that's the conclusion I think we come to, unfortunately. Um, but what has been said is, is instrumental in beginning to understand exactly as I think you began to put over, that inherent in growing as a youth, there are challenges. There are unavoidable challenges. You have to learn how to um, become more independent. You have to learn how to um, conduct yourself in a certain manner. All range of challenges. Superimpose on top of that an environment where you're not encouraged to test, to you know, explore, to see what's right for you so that you can then fully contribute from who you are and give to the people around you in, in the society that you contribute right. to. That it is, it is a daunting task, unfortunately, for many of, for many of us, for many young people. Um, at the university, generally, where I come in is where people have been troubled, you know, for several years, perhaps, with identity concepts. Who am I? 
Um, you know, how is my family going to accept me? Right? Where am I going to uh, fit in? How am I going to find a job? Um, even to get past, you know, what should I dress like? Is is a significant is a significant challenge, and so what that then manifests sometimes by the time it reaches me is a clinical kind of disturbance, where it could be even as far reaching as panic attack, or more so likely it's a depressive or an affective kind of disorder, so that people generally deal with at least a dysthymic kind of which is a, is a more moderate level of depression. But certainly, and in the clip, people made reference to becoming suicidal. That is commonplace, mm -hmm. unfortunately commonplace. And of, you know, everyone is aware of our um, difficulty. Guyanese societies embrace, unfortunately, uh, of suicide as, as a route to, to resolve certain issues. But, um, that is integral in the struggles of people who are, you know, trying to, to work these, these things out. Um, so depression is, is by and large the, the biggest presentation that, that I have to deal with, you know, with people that come to see me at the university. So is, is it fair to say that homophobia and transphobia are a major contributing factor to poor mental health outcomes for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth? I, I think we need to be careful there because um, I, I don't want to promote this idea that people who are struggling with sexual identity and sexual orientation are any different mm. because they're not. They just have issues, um, additional issues and, and, and I, again, want to be careful with the wording that I use because it's not even issues. They're, they're normal kinds of challenges that everybody has to work out. Every person has to work out who they are, mm -hmm. how they fit into this world, mm -hmm. right? Those are normal, and they should. They should take those challenges on. But my, my, my question is whether the prejudice and discrimination mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they suffer kind of compounds Most definitely. The, the everyday challenges that other young people without have. Without a doubt. Right. Without a doubt. Right. Um, in fact, to the point where I don't see probably but the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. because that stuff alienates people. It scares people from coming to actually try to do something about it. Um, and, and, and I can respect that because it is a formidable challenge. And this is one of the issues that we are trying to research and work out at SASA in terms of how to develop a mental health program that mm -hmm. will serve LGBT people in particular. Mm -hmm. And we're in the process now of doing analysis from a national survey. I wanted to ask Unuka to jump in here, particularly uh, on one of the issues that Michelle raised around the health and family life education in schools, because I know GRPA does a lot of work in the area of sexuality education and is really championing advocacy for comprehensive sexuality education in schools. So I just wanted to know if you could speak to that about what's happening now, what are the plans to really develop sexuality education in schools, and particularly around the issue of teaching young people about sexual and gender diversity so we could reduce homophobic and transphobic bullying and violence. Great, thank you so much, Joelle. Um, just to speak to HFLE, well, we know that's a big um, part of our work at GRPA. It's also mm -hmm. part of the work of SASID. We know and a couple other civil society organizations. For the health and family life education, let me just start by saying the existing curriculum caters to sexuality education from more of a heterosexual perspective, which contributes to a lot of the confusion, turmoil that young LGBT persons experience, but it also contributes to the misinformation and the ignorance of a lot of their peers and teachers. And we, we, we see experiences like uh, Alessandra's, or we have our own youth, um, our own core youth group that uh, work along with these persons, and they'll share stories you know, with us in terms of persons, not only depression, contemplating suicide, also wanting to leave their homes, finding, finding support in maybe not always the right places, you know. So it's important, let me just say that it's very important for us to get it out there. What exists right now, um, 
uh, in terms of some of our work that we're doing around the HFLE program, we have partnered with the Ministry of Education to do work in school. Uh, we're building on the existing HFLE program. So while HFLE kit has its limitations, we are working within within our realm to do an HFLE plus kind of program. So what we're doing with our program is going in there, giving them the additional information, including information on sexual around sexuality, enabling students and teachers too to understand what their students are going through, what their peers are going through, because it's important. Teachers are very play an instrumental role in supporting the mental health of their of their students, and we see we've gotten a lot of cases where teachers don't understand what's going on, so they're contributing to the problem. Right. So that's you know, so it's really important for us to work along, and the, the schools that we're working with, we're ensuring that we have persons who are point persons in the schools who are. For sustainability purposes, GRP may not always be able to do the work that we're doing with those particular groups. But you know, when we leave, we leave our teachers, we leave our students who are peer educators within that realm, and also we're working to build um, peer support networks. You know, our youth advocacy movement, which is the youth arm of the Ghana Responsible Parenthood Association, they're very instrumental in doing a lot of. Um, the in-school work, but we don't only do in-school work, we do a lot of work with youth out of school, working with the faith-based organizations, community groups, we work with parenting groups also, we're promoting parenting education because it's very important, and I think Michelle spoke about you know, the importance of having parents involved in understanding the process that, that these children are going through because a lot of times we find that you know parents are not, they don't understand what's going on, so they don't know how to f support their children. They don't know how to support mm -hmm. their children because of their biases, you know, society's biases, culture, all of these, all of these things add to the confusion. So where we are right now is just working primarily to promote the education, but also on the advocacy um, bit, you know, we work, continue to work with our partners. And um, I know the Ministry of Education is undergoing, um, they're currently reviewing the HFLE yeah. program. and. Um, given advocacy that's been done on the international level and at the regional level, you know, the CARICOM, they have the COSHOT framework on teenage pregnancy, which includes yeah. comprehensive mm -hmm. sexuality education. There's several other declarations that mm -hmm. um, Ghana has signed on to. And the last, um, the last CRC, the UNCRC, Ch Children's Rights Commission, they've recommended um, comprehensive sexuality education. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are being considered um, and also you know we have our health policies our national sexual reproductive health policies all of these things are calling for comprehensive sexuality education I think the Ministry of Education is listening and they are really looking yeah. to you yeah. know yeah. address address yeah. it and our biggest concern now as um, <laughs> organizations on the ground is how fast they're going yeah. to really you know get it up and running yeah. the expediency of, of it all. Yeah. Let me ask Michelle yeah. to jump in here on yes. that point too. Yes, I'd like to say that while um, one of the reasons that the Ministry of Education is um, moving in that direction, it has taken years of advocacy. UNICEF has been working, UNICEF Guyana has been working in, in, in terms of advocacy, but more than that, to also help to influence the policy. And just recently, uh, towards the end of last year, it, there was really a, a, a big progress in making certain that the whole of the HFLE program could be revised and to make certain that, in addition, it's, it's not just that the, the important thing is not to make, just change a program, but it's how to help, you rightly said, the, the teachers. And so it's, it is not only going to be a health and family life education unit, it's a unit that will include the counseling, it's the unit that will include health and nutrition, there is sports and culture for development, and these are the things that UNICEF is really tr giving some technical um, support to. And it, it is so lovely that everyone is beginning to see how important it is and how absolutely necessary it is for all the agencies to work together, you know. Um, 
yes, CARICOM, there is UNFPA, United Nations Population Fund, together with UNICEF. And I think what has to happen is to make certain that it doesn't stop at the Ministry of Education or just in the primary primary and secondary school system, that has to be something which is quite holistic. Where do we move from there? How are we going to make certain that it is incorporated in just the same fashion in the teacher training program? Okay. And what are some of the spin-offs? What might be some of the um, areas in which even the University of Guyana needs to look at, it, at its program? So. It has to be very intersectorial. We can no longer work in silos and to make certain that, that that goes very, very well. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And on that note, we've come to the end of this segment of our program. Now I'm going to hand you over to our Advocacy and Communications Officer, Shamel Patrick, who is going to tell you about some of the activities that we at SASAD have coming up for International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia and how you could promote it. And, and support those activities. Over to you, Shamel. Sasset Guyana is very happy to be participating in this year's International Gay Against Homophobia and Transphobia celebrations. With the team being LGBT youth, we are engaging youth where they are the most, social media. Starting today, we've launched two innovative and exciting social media campaigns. The first campaign is called our Statement Selfie Campaign, where we're asking you to take a selfie and post it to Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter speaking out against homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia affecting LGBT youth. The second campaign is where we're inviting you to participate in our Rainbow for Ida Hot Photo Day Challenge, where we'll be utilizing the colors of the LGBT pride flag. For more information about both of our campaigns, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Welcome back. Um, thanks for joining us again in studio. We have a special program today for International Day Against Homophobia, biphobia and transphobia, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth in focus. And we have an excellent panel here with us continuing the discussion. Alessandra, I want to get back to you again and talk particularly about your experiences as a transgender, as a young transgender woman accessing health care, um, sexual health care, particularly hormone therapy. You spoke about starting uh, hormone replacement therapy. And what has that been like for you here in Guyana? Well, first of all, Joel, um, we don't have specialists in Guyana to deal with transgender individuals, and those are endocrinologists, they're um, psychologists, we don't have much. Because transgender, some transgender people would um, use hormone replacement therapy to develop the physical characteristic of the biological gender they identify with. So a male to female transgender would use female sex hormone in the form of injections or pills and the female to male transgender would use the male hormone. And because we don't have much doctor who understand transgender needs, they don't really know how to deal with transgender individuals. And because of that reason, we find most of the transgender population going online, researching, purchasing hormones from the local pharmacies, and they're self-medicating. And that's very dangerous because the hormones, they are a lot of side effects that could affect the individual um, and these side effects, they are detrimental. Right, I can imagine that. Yeah. Um, Renuka, I know GRPA is a leading provider of sexual and reproductive health services. Is GRPA doing anything in this area um, in particular uh, on providing any services, sexual health, mental health services for LGBT youth? Well, at uh, GRPA, we do, as you know, GRPA, we provide holistic services. So while we do provide health care services, we also have a very strong uh, counseling program where we do psychosocial support. Our counselors are trained to work with uh, young LGBT persons, and we've been doing, we've been seeing an increase in some of our clients coming in, and um, that's propelled us to do some further partnership with um, some other NGOs. And um, in terms of of psychosocial support for mm -hmm. university students in particular, and maybe older youth who are not at UG, um, what exists? I know many times a lot of the young people that come to us are often university students or mm -hmm. um, young adults who are working who right. need psychological support and so on. To my knowledge, unfortunately, that resource is, is dwindling, in fact. Um, mm -hmm very very unfortunately because we lost Dr. Faith Harding uh, recently 
Um, I have knowledge that uh, another one of our psycho psychiatrists is making tracks soon, and and I unfortunately am leaving in 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 due course as well. So there are only uh, there only ever are a handful of psychiatrists available here, um, and some at the national hospital as well. Um, and then, if you want to ask about well specialization with regards to these kinds of of uh, challenges, I, we don't really have that at all. Exactly as Alexandra said. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I think there's a link between sometimes the poor educational outcomes that LGBT youth and marginalized youth in general mm -hmm. suffer um, in the school system and the impact that it has on their employment prospects. Um, is UNICEF or maybe the UN, why the UN system in general doing anything in particular to work with or support programs that work with either marginalized youth who've dropped out of school, um, young people who didn't do so well at CXC and you know, yes. need a second shot at it, or anything of the sort um, to improve the educational outcomes for young people who, 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 who didn't have a fair shot? Oh, oh yes, yes, thank you. Um, UNICEF has done, it started out with what is one of the critical things that we have to do, and that is research. And having investigated the um, section of society who are marginalized and particularly um, those who are have different sexual orientations and including other forms of marginalization that research is now out um, we, they have also been looking and 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 disseminated um, UNICEF Guyana is also supporting together with other agencies the youth policy and, and really paying a lot of attention to all the issues in terms of protection and participation. So in terms of not only in school participation, but participation in the world of work. And so um, a lot of technical support has been given to that. And I actually, and I think that the research on the marginalized uh, young key affected populations has given a lot of thought into the redesigning of the health and family life education program. So it's not that the research is being put on a shelf, it's being looked at too in relation to the youth policy and its findings are being considered and, and, and being utilized in an effective way in, in, in the policy and in the terms of the revision of the health and family life education program. That's very encouraging you know, news. Which tells us that also there is need for attitudinal change, not only for the parents, but right. for the teachers, and, and which will take a lot of time, the public education that we'd have to do, mm -hmm. and the consistency, and it's not something that will have to be done only in a particular month or a week, but right. it's something that's ongoing. ongoing. So um, UNICEF has been playing quite a big role in, in those areas, as well as it, even in the Child Friendly Schools program and in our Child Protection program, where we are looking at the how to review the protective laws for children, because we believe in creating, a, um, having a comprehensive approach to creating um, a preventative and protective environment for children's participation and their their contributions to society. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alessandra, I know employment is a sore issue for many LGBT people. Do you have any experiences with employment in Guyana, job seeking or otherwise, or on the job? Um, you'd like to share? Yes. Um, I finished high school in 2009, and ever since I've been looking, I've been seeking for um, meaningful employment. And I've always been rejected. I don't know the reason why, if it's because of my presentation, of how I present myself. In terms um, of your gender identity? And my expression. Gender because, expression? Yeah, mm -hmm. my gender expression is androgynous. It's a mix between masculinity and femininity. Right. I don't know the true reason behind not getting through with a job. 
uh, from 2009 to now it's six years. Um, so I've been volunteering at a non-governmental organization and that's where I have my income from. Um, many LGBT youth I know after high school they would want to have a job and sometimes because of our sexual orientation and gender identity or how people may perceive us, they would not want us to um, have the job or so. Right. I know one of the challenges is that there's a lack of legislative protection mm -hmm. in the area of employment. The Prevention of Discrimination Act 1997 mm -hmm. does not include sexual orientation and gender identity as grounds for discrimination and that's going to be a major focus for us at SASA uh, moving forward, um, especially with the new government on having that legislation amended to offer protection so that people seeking jobs, people experiencing discrimination in the workplace, whether it's in terms of recruitment, training, promotion, and so on, have legal recourse at least um, when it comes to discrimination on those grounds. Let me ask my panel for closing comments uh, generally. Uh, I think we're pretty much out of time. So I'll start with Renuka. Okay. Um well, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank you, Joelle, for host having us here today. And just to reinforce the importance of um, embracing uh, young LGBT persons, you know, we talk a lot about rights and human rights, but there's also, you know, the concept of sexual rights, which, are ha which go hand in hand with uh, LG um, human rights. And it's important for us to understand that um, while we go out and we promote our work. It's not just only about acceptance of persons, it's about persons accepting themselves and the right to non-discrimination, the right to access services, the right to access education, the right to access jobs. All of these are embraced in, 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 uh, in our Declaration of Sexual Rights Principles. So it's very important for us to really understand the issues and also for us to really take strong steps like we're doing right now, like all of us are doing, by getting the word out there, but also really taking an active role, playing an active role in education. I can do it, you can do it, you know, everyone can do it at, a, at an individual level, at a family level, at a community level. So it's very important, especially as we observe today, International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Transphobia, you know, these are things that are very real. These, these, these are our reality. And it's key for us as individuals to recognize the role we play in supporting our fellow citizens. Great. Dan? I would say thank you and, and thanks to the panelists as well. Um, and I would like to underscore the fact that we are more similar than we are different. Um, and I think that that should be a concept that people return to time and time again when you walk down the street and when you see different people, right? That we, in fact, share more commonality than anything else. And that the way that we decide to treat with that, in fact, can inflict serious harm on people and unnecessarily so to the point where we have to get together and talk about all the change and and you know implementation that's necessary to combat those things that it has serious ramifications yeah. Michelle yes and thank you again and um, from the UNICEF end I could only say remind everyone that every child by extension every person has a right to his or her own identity and that every person has a right to pursue every child every person has a right to pursue his or her own interests and to have their potentials fulfilled and for us to do that we have to have our attitude change across the board parents teachers nurses doctors police the magistracy right. you know throughout and um, communities uh, because it is our responsibility to give support to every child, every person to reach his or her potential. Alexandra? Joel, I would just like to um, say thank you for this opportunity. The voice issues affecting the LGBT community. I mean, we grew up in a society where we're socialized in such a way 
where we learn this word separate, separation between masculinity and femininity. And to just go out there and ask people to accept gender and sexual minority is not that easy. We need to educate people. I believe through education we could go a far away. Educating them about gender and sexual minority mm -hmm. and sexual diversity. And only through education and public awareness, we could transform the society of stigma and discrimination into one that is tolerable to our gender and sexual minority. Great, well said. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all my panelists for joining me again, Alessandra, Michelle, Dam, Renuka. Yeah. Thank you to our viewers for watching. I'm Joel Simpson, Managing Director of the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination. You've been watching a special program, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Youth in Focus, in observance of the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>